Seven o'clock, Your Worship. Yep. Okay. Good evening, everybody. I'll bring this uh, regular council meeting to order on Monday, May, June the 6th, 7 p.m., and to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of Stahelis. Next order of business, please. Yes, we'll move on to number two. Do you have any late items? No late items this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have approval of the agenda then, please? Moved by Councillor Piper, second by Councillor Vidal. Call the question. All in favor? Opposed, nobody. Thank you. Next order of business. Yes, we'll move on to number four, adoption of council minutes. We have the regular council meeting minutes of May 16, 2022 here for adoption. Do we have a move and a second? A move by Councillor Piper, second by Councillor Vidal. Are there any errors or omissions? Here none, I call the question. All in favor? Opposed, nobody, thank you. Next order of business. Yes, Your Worship, we have any business arising from the minutes? Any business from councillors arising from the minutes? Being none, we'll move on, please. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, number six, the consent agenda. This evening we have correspondence uh, from Fraser Health and it's a letter of thanks for success of COVID-19 immunization clinics here for receipt. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Vidal, second by Councillor Palmer. Call the question, all in favor? Opposed, nobody, thank you. Next order of business, please. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. We'll move on to delegation and petitions. This evening we have Nevelle Berard and Veronique Burgo of Northwest Hydraulic Consultants, LTD. Good evening, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so just, uh, can you all hear me? <laughs> My name is Neville Burrard and I'm here with Vero Burgo. So we are from NHC. Uh, we are, if I speak louder, does that help? Can I test that? Is that better? Okay, feel free to holler if I'm a little too quiet. Okay, all right. So we are both coastal engineers from Northwest Hydraulics. Um, coastal engineers, you might be surprised to see us so far in land, but as you're all aware, uh, we're at the southern edge of a very large lake, which acts like a coastal system. So combined with our river hydraulics colleagues, we've teamed together to work on this project for your waterfront. Uh, and I will test this. Tyler, where should I point this? At you? Okay. Apologies, next slide, please. Okay, so what I'm gonna be speaking about tonight is a little bit of background of this project. I'll also be speaking about uh, a grant, which we were successful in achieving last year, and which has been the funding basis of this work and the results of this study. I'm also gonna be talking a little bit about the recommendations going forward and the next steps that we recommend uh, the village take. Next slide, please. So a little bit of background about the waterfront hazards here on Harrison Lake. Next slide, Tyler. So as you're all aware, the, the Harrison Dyke has been around for over 50 years, almost over 70, and it was built after the floods of 1948. So that flood is the second largest flood on record for the Fraser, for the Fraser River. That's only second to the 1894 floods, which have a return period of over 500 years. So the 1948 flood is a little bit less than a 500 year return period is what it's been estimated at. So the elevation of the dike running 1.5 kilometers along your waterfront is about 13.9 to 14.1 meters. And it's long been acknowledged that this is under height. So the first sort of uh, acknowledgement of this fact is from a, a report, which I've got an excerpt of in the bottom right. And this is actually taken from the operations and maintenance manual for the Harrison Dyke. And it acknowledges that the recommended height for the dike would be 14.5 meters to withstand both the five or the 200 year return uh, period flood, um, in addition to the expected waves that could be expected to be on top of that water level. Uh, in that report, in the operations and maintenance manual, they recommend that sandbags are used during these events to stop overtopping water, which is quite a significant amount of sandbags that would be required along the length of the waterfront. In 2015, NHC also um, was the consultant that worked on the lower mainland dike inventory. And in that report, more recently, it was found that the Harrison Dyke did have sufficient um, elevation to protect against the design flood, the 500 year flood, but there was no freeboard to allow for 
um, any overtopping uh, or any risk of uh, uh, a dike. Um, sorry, I'm losing my words today, but any risk of uh, damage to the dike where seepage would cause uh, damage to it. Next slide, please, Tyler. So also as part of this work, what we were looking at was the wastewater treatment plant roadway. So as you can see here on the right is a photo of this during the, the most recent high water event that the, the village um, experienced during 2018. And so what you can see is the water encroaching on the roadway, but it also shows erosion at the top of that road. Um, so this, uh, the village has applied for previous grant funding uh, to support upgrades along this roadway, um, which were not successful on a number of occasions. And the main uh, focus of that recommendation was to get new hydrotechnical analysis uh, done of the lakefront. Next slide, please. So the current scope began. Next slide. And in early 2021, NHC supported the village to make an application for the Union of BC Municipalities Community Emergency Preparedness Fund. So this was a successful grant application and the work that has come out of it has included new data collection, site inspection, uh, updated and recommended design like water levels, a wave effects assessment and flood protection recommendations. Next. So this data collection had a number of factors. Uh, we wanted the latest elevation data so that we could make uh, recommendations for the height along the dike. So Terra Remote was on site in 2021 and they collected a number of data sources. They collected conventional survey data, walking by foot along the elevation of the dike and taking shots of the center line. They collected single beam bathymetry, which was to add to our existing digital elevation model that we had in-house of the full lake bathymetry. And they also collected vessel-based LIDAR, which is a newer technique, uh, which is basically LIDAR that was on a pole on their boat above water looking sideways. And that's what you see on the right there. So all this data, like I said, we used it, supplemented with our in-house data and also publicly available GOBC LIDAR and other data sources uh, from the government of BC. Next slide. So our waterfront inspection was next. And what we've done here is we've broken up the zones, our, your waterfront into zones that we can talk about as sort of different, different systems. So zone one is the wastewater treatment plant itself. Zone two is the roadway, which has been a focus of the, some of this work. And zones three to six uh, are the dike. So zone three is in front of the Harrison Hot Springs Resort with mostly rip uh, slope. And that starts at Miami Creek and includes that system. Zone four is the public beach with sand there. Zone five, the Harrison Lagoon. And zone six is uh, the sandy beach on the eastern extent in front of the residential properties. Next slide. During our inspection, we, um, we took down details that would help us sort of understand how the dike waterfront and the wastewater treatment road water plant water, uh, the roadway was functioning. So on the left is just an example of some degraded riprap that's just east of Miami Creek. So the reasons we would consider this degraded is it's not functioning as it would have been designed. There's spines coming through uh, from the, the material behind it. And there's also a significant presence of invasives which could have um, dislodged or moved around the material. So Himalayan blackberry, as many of you are familiar, is, is an invasive and can cause make it really difficult to both inspect and to, uh, um, and to uh, repair rip rum. On the right, we've got erosion at the lock block wall, um, which is another uh, common attribute that we observed along the dike front. Next slide, please. So this is a uh, photo of a map from the Fraser Basin Council um, work that was done by NHC in 2019. And this was a 2D hydraulic model that looked at a variety of scenarios for Fraser flood events. So this does not consider flooding coming from the south. This is the Fraser flooding specifically. So this is just one of the examples that shows um, the extent of flooding during an event. And this is our model that we used in-house to uh, come up with the recommended water levels for the lake. Next slide, please. So this is a, a snapshot of water levels from our report. And so starting from the left, what we looked at was a variety of situations. So we looked at current day, we looked at mid-century, which we've defined as about 2050, and we looked at end of century. And for each of those mid-century and end of century, we're using the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium's um, 2018 climate change uh, projections. 
The next column is AEP, which stands for annual exceedance probability, and is another way to talk about return periods. So the 0.2% event is roughly equal to the 500 year return period. And that's what uh, has been bolded, which is a bit hard to see in this, in each of those. So for the current day, we've got our 0.2% AEP event, which is about a 13.9 water level for 500 years on Harrison Lake. For 2050, that's 14.6 meters. And for 2100, that's 15.6 meters. So something that is being actively discussed in the scientific community is science the projections for climate change and how these will change uh, as we learn more and see how the world is reacting. So these are the 2018 projections that we've presented here. Uh, some more recent projections that are very actively under debate show that mid-century could be worse than end of century and these, these projections will continue to be updated. Um, but until we have sort of a consensus, these are the projections that have been adopted by the scientific community in BC. Next slide, please. So in order to understand sort of the second feature of the risk on the waterfront, we have to look at the wind data in the area to come up with the exposure to wave events on the lake. So using um, publicly available wind data, we looked at the regional stations and the one that we have used for this analysis is the Environment Canada um, Agassiz station, which is to the south Harrison. The topography surrounding that station does not accurately represent the Harrison waterfront. Uh, as I'm sure you all know from driving through the areas, there's different exposure, there's different topography surrounding it, but it still gives us an idea of magnitudes. So the wind rose on the right, it shows the Agassiz station and the different winds coming from the areas. And with that, we have found the max wind speeds expected for various events, like a 50 year event or a 100 year event. And we have just assumed that they would be coming directly down the lake for our analysis is sort of a conservative assumption. Next slide. With this, we performed wave modeling of the lake. So we did modeling looking at the entire, uh, we had a coarse grid large model. And with that results, we have a sort of a fine grid model of the Harrison waterfront. Um, we modeled a variety of conditions, looking at different wind events in different directions. And basically what we have determined is sort of a maximum event would be 1.2 meters to 1.3. And with that, we look at the run up along your waterfront, which would be about one to 1.5. So when I talk about run up or our 2%, as you'll see there, that's sort of the maximum elevation on the dike that the waves would rush up. That's the point they would reach. 2% of those would exceed that height. Next slide, please. So this is just a summary of when we talk about all these elevations, how they come together. So I've shown them for the different zones here and with a 200 year water level is what this snapshot is showing. So this is a 13.6 meter. So if we were to have a 200 year uh, water level today at the dike, and then we were to look at those wave effects that run up in the different zones, uh, we'd also want to apply a bit of a freeboard. So there's different recommendations for freeboard between 30 and 60 centimeters, 0 0.3 meters is what we've shown here. And this gives you an idea of what kind of elevation would be recommended for the dike for those various situations or the roadway. Next slide, please. So with that, this, we have some recommendations. So the first thing I wanna point out is, is sort of understanding the risk. So we've talked about how climate projections uh, will change in the future. And also um, that present day, the dike is you know, almost at its, um, almost, but not quite at a recommended level for the uh, design water level. So present day, we've got a 14 meter elevation um, dike and that will withstand um, theoretically the water level of that event. That does not include the waves we've talked about or the freeboard. Um, a 16 meter or dike, for example, in that first column, which is quite extreme, um, would, ex ex um, would be protecting against a greater than 500 year event. Looking to the right, mid-century or 2050, which is not that far away, a 14 meter dike would withstand a 100 to 200 year event without any protection for waves on top of it. However, if we then look at a 15 meter dike, you've still got protection against that, uh, that static water level of greater than 500 years. So it's sort of a, a risk versus um, elevation uh, analysis at this point. Next slide, please. So the roadway. Current elevation is, is around 13 meters. There are low spots as low we found in some dips of about 12.2 meters and some locations it's up to about 14 meters. 
we recommend that this is raised to about 14 meters. This would allow access during almost all extreme events for the, the village staff to be able to reach the wastewater treatment plant, which is sort of a critical piece of infrastructure. Um, and if the riprap was repaired, this would mean that it would not be eroding during those events so that post event, you would still have access to the infrastructure. Next slide, please. The dike. So the dike is approximately 14 meters, like we've talked about, and we would recommend raising this to 15 meters. This gives you protection for a variety of future scenarios with waves and static water levels. It's not, um, it won't change the waterfront so much as the 16 meter elevation would. And the 15 meters is also consistent um, with the Miami Creek pump station, um, which would be, it would fit in well with that. Next slide. Um, Moving into the future, if you have a dike of 15 meters, there's some other pieces of infrastructure that you could look at that are sort of less permanent and less civil and earthworks focused. Um, so what we've shown on the right here is, is what we'd call a return wall. This would, if waves, if installed properly, it would stop waves from over top, topping your dike. So this is quite a large example of one that man there is for scale. Um, but these are sort of pieces that could be applied to, to vulnerable sections um, and are less um, impactful than widening the dike in some areas. We also recommend that you review the surface water runoff along the dike waterfront, because we have noticed uh, surface water runoff um, impacts and potentially shoreline nourishment, which would mean adding sand to the beach and locations, um, which would create more surface area for people to enjoy, but would also reduce wave runoffs um, along the crest of the dike. Next slide. And finally, the grant that uh, Tyson will be speaking about. Next slide. Um, so the application is due June 30th. Um, the application requirements are primarily, one of them is a council recommendation. Secondly is a feasibility study for the infrastructure, um, which would be covered by our report, which has been developed for the first stage of the works that are done. Next would be drawings, engineering drawings, which we are in the process of developing, and it would require a cost estimate. So we've also lined up some additional contributors to help with this that would be available, which would include Thurber, who we've worked with across the Lower Mainland Dike Assessment and has um, good knowledge of, of seismic considerations and the geotech requirements for dike upgrades, and Aquaterra, who's well known here in the village um, and has done a lot of permitting. Next. So the recommended funding requests we would recommend because the grant has a, a maximum ask for the capital work stream of 6 million. We would recommend asking for about $1 million for the wastewater treatment plant road upway, roadway upgrades and about $5 million for the dike improvements. The dike is a significant piece of infrastructure and it's really long and to add earthworks uh, combined with engineering and geotech and all that permitting that will be required, it's not a, it's not a small ask. So the application would, this, these two cost estimates, the 1 million and the 5 million, they would include uh, money for detailed design of these uh, pieces of infrastructure. They would include money for permitting, construction, and also construction support and administration. Next slide. And that is the end of my formal presentation. Good evening. Um, I noticed you've got to raise the uh, the roadway to the wastewater station up to 14 metres, yet the dike height is going to be 15 metres. Doesn't water come in round that surpass the dike height? Yeah, so, so the, the dike height recommendation includes um, recommendations to stop waves from coming over top of it. And also, as soon as you have any wave energy coming over top of a dike, the most vulnerable part of a dike is off of the backside of it. And that's when you would get um, dike failure events, right? The backside is eroded and it starts to slowly erode. With the wastewater treatment plant road, the idea of the 14 meters is that if there is an event where waves come over top of it, it's not gonna cause lasting damage and that the village staff could still access in a small amount of water. Yeah, because the concern is, is that the uh, resort hotel, some of their rooms are below the flat level. 
So they could actually experience some form of minor flooding. But so the, the recommendation for the 14 meters starts on the other side of Miami Creek. So in front of the Harrison Hot Springs, it would be up to 15. Do I understand correctly or no? Yeah. The, the other point is we've addressed the overflowing of the, the dike. We've not suggest or not looked at any uh, failure of the dike from below, seepage through causing the failure. Um, and everything has been a visual inspection. There's been no actual physical inspection of the ground beneath this, correct? Correct. So, so part of our recommendations and part of what Thurber would look at would be scoping out an investigation to do spot drilling along mm. there. We do have some uh, cross sections of the dike when it was originally built and some upgrades, but it's not enough information, like mm. you said, and, and that would be part of the detailed design when done by a geotech to look at that. Mm. And you've come up with the recommendations of five minutes. How do we address the areas like the boat launch and Rendell Park? So the boat launch is an interesting one. I think we would look at trade-offs. So what we're coming up with now is sort of conceptual level. So there will be options for the dike. You could look at, you know, temporary, like that could, or not the dike for the boat launch. That could be an area that potentially is subject to sandbagging if it's cheaper than, you know, raising just that one section. There's also some sort of uh, temporary, not temporary, but permanent installations that um, are more expensive, but there's sort of, you know, gates that would raise up. And for a short area, those can be cost effective to sort of close off one location um, if that is more cost effective than raising that and rebuilding the boat launch. The boat launch has a, a pretty um, shallow slope in general, a lot shallower than a lot of uh, other boat launches in the lower mainland, and, and it could be adjusted if needed. Yeah, just two more questions. You've got the uh, concrete barriers for the, the wave. Um, now, where would they be situated? On the existing concrete wall, because there'd be a towing and healing effect of the waves on them, wouldn't there? If those were to be utilized, I think they would probably be in the future and they would be at the crest on the pathway. So you'd end up with a, with a situation where you've got, you know, a bit more of a slope up and picture where the, the gravel pathway is right now. They would be sort of on the leading edge of that and they would be, you would need to design so that wave scour would not affect the base of them. Right. And are you, oh no, you, you're not getting involved in the construction, this sort of thing, but would you consider having rigid and temporary systems in place. Can I ask what you mean by rigid and temporary? Temporary, like some form of a barrier dam that can be filled and the rest of it. Because by putting all this up and raising, I think, a meter, it's going to have an adverse effect on some of the businesses because of their view and the rest of it. So there's a lot, lot to be considered this, but thank you for, oh, one last question. You've mentioned in your report about a tsunami from Mount Breckenridge. And uh, um, yes, although we can't control that, I was looking at the down east one, how uh, that's being monitored and the rest of it by BC Hydro. Which down east one? The Downey. Yeah. And uh, um, the effect of Mount Breckenridge could be catastrophic, but also will it affect the dams that are along the the rivers, like uh, Big Silver and the rest of it, or whether you can't address that. I don't think I can address that in, a, in any kind of sort of meaningful way. I mean, I think if that was to happen, there would be effects downstream at other locations for sure. Thank you very much for your report. Thank you. What, um, the, the actual lagoon, do we know the height of the lagoon? How, how high is that? We have it, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I think it's around 13. It's lower than the dike crest, but it's between 12 and 13 along that edge. Just out of curiosity, in terms of the wave action, would, if the lagoon, if the lagoon is almost as high as the, as the dike that we have along the beach, would there still be a wave problem along the lagoon? Wouldn't it break on the lagoon and you wouldn't have to worry so much about the, the wave remediation 
uh, along the beach, at least in so far as the lagoon is, or, or am I missing the point in terms of how waves would work? No, no, you're completely correct. The, uh, it acts as like an offshore breakwater, right? If it's inundated, it still does take away wave energy. And for that reason, the run up behind it would be significantly less. Um, because our recommendation for 15 meters is sort of consistent and it's mostly for static water level, we haven't looked at reducing the height of the dike behind the lagoon in our current recommendations. And I'm trying to visualize, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm very supportive of raising the, the height of the dike. Uh, that's obviously a safety issue. Just thinking about how it looks. I'm just, so the actual dike along the beach, uh, the increase, what, what, would, what would it be made of? Or what would the, the increased dike, would it be concrete or gravel or, or it can't be just sand? How, how would that, what would that be constructed of and what would be visible of it? So I think there's still options for that. One option, because it, it, it sounds like one meter sounds like a lot, but if you think about it, it's about this high off of the current and then uh, standards sort of in BC are about a four meter crest. So you would be raising it about a meter for a four meter width. And then we would recommend sloping down at a three to one slope on either side. And that's probably the most cost-effective because that would be earthworks. So you'd see a grassy slope on either side and a gravel slope on top or gravel pathway. Right, so you'd have your pathway kind of similar to what you have right now, but you'd see a slightly larger mound of earthworks on the center of the dike. There are also options that we've talked about and we can look at or would be looked at potentially um, involving sort of raising the or replacing the wall that's facing the parking, you know, so you could shift that back sort of where the center of the dike is and you'd have a wall, a larger wall there potentially with some artwork. Um, and then a higher crest, and then you'd have maybe a, a more gradual slope, grassy slope facing towards the lake. So those are kind of, you can shift a little bit where the center of the dike is and what the pathway is on top, but it would look likely at least on one side, like a, an, an increased mound of earth with grass. And I'm sorry, one, <clears throat> so the, the top of that, you mentioned the gravel pathway, would it actually be gravel or would it not be concrete? Uh, like some of the dike now has is, is got kind of a, cro a concrete walkway, which I take is more secure and less likely to erosion. Would the kind of money that we're, we'd be paying, the $5 million, would that only be gravel or it would allow concrete? Um, so I would say standards for dikes, like our minimum gravel. So there's no requirement for concrete. Having concrete can add, you know, scour effects in some areas. Um, but for that type of money, I mean, we haven't done the detailed, 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 but I think it could be looked at. I don't think it in any way excludes having a concrete pathway along the top. Okay. Uh, thank you. That, 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 those are my questions at this point. Councilor Piper and Councilor Vital. Thank you, Worship. And thank you for the report. Um, I think it was a lesson learned from our previous grant applications to ha so have to have a report of this depth and um, coverage is really going to going to assist, I'm sure. Um, it's vital that we protect our critical infrastructure. So I have a question about the wastewater treatment plant itself. As it, um, is it vulnerable from wave action as well on the north side, I guess it would be? So I think the, the elevation of the wastewater treatment plant, we are looking more into this right now, but I will say it's around 15 meters. So I think there's potential for some wave overtopping, um, but we have, so it would not be inundated for the uh, next 50 years based on current projections. Um, I would need to look more and to see if uh, it'll be vulnerable to wave action. Thank you. For Councilor Vital. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, thank you for the extensive report and presentation. Just. Um, Couple of questions. In, in, in the report, you referenced the road out to the wastewater treatment plant and how down by the, the source, we call it, um, you indicated that uh, in the early spring when the, the lake level is quite low, that quite often people will create their own little <laughs> hot pools. Um, so you indicated that that may be also contributing because these people, are they actually removing rocks from the side of the, of the road in order to, to form their pools? 
if that's the case, you know, perhaps, you know, in the future, it may be something that we're going to have to visit then. Thank you. I think from from my um, observations walking along there, I think the the riprap along that location, there's some spots where it's large and, and I would say, in my opinion, properly sized and other locations where there's been repairs many years ago. And those repairs were, were smaller rock. So I think it's kind of a combination of some smaller rock was used in these locations and then it is people are able to pick it up and to use it. And that's what it looked like to me from my perspective. Um, but I think it wouldn't be a problem if upgrades were completed and there was, you know, uh, 400, 500 mil rock being used. It's not something the general public would be able to, to carry away. Good. Um, thank you. And um, I think uh, it was uh, Council Palmer who brought it up. I uh, just have a concern raising the dike right along Esplanade waterfront, um, sort of like blocking the view of, of, of businesses. But I think that you have um, satisfied my concern um, with your answer to um, Councillor Palmer. So yeah, nothing further right now, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hooper. Yes, thank you. It's in the high water up to the top of the dike would actually could actually still get into the village through the drainage system unless we got floods uh, flaps on the any pipes that drain into the Miami or into the uh, um, Harrison Lake. Um, and you mentioned the, the river flows now in the Miami and the rest of it in your report. Would any dredging of that Miami River to make it deeper be of any use to prevent flooding internally into the village? Again, with all the other drainage channels that we got that seem to be sort of, uh, neglected as such. That's, I mean, that's not something we've looked at in, in the course of the study. And I think we would have to, to look at if that would make a difference, to be honest. And I've always been wary of uh, the flood defenses unless they're all done in one continuous flow. Any flood defenses further downstream say Surrey and the rest of it, that would actually slow the water flow up. So the razor, that would actually have a backwash flow into the Harrison and the Fraser. So I will say the the, the reports that were done uh, by for, for Fraser Basin Council assumed no dike breaching. Right. So that kind of assumed that the water was constrained yeah. as it is right now. And I think yeah. with the current climate, we're not likely to see any further constriction. You know, we're looking at where there's room, communities, you know, making more space for water. Um, so I think, yeah, it's kind of right now, it's the most conservative assumption and that the water is constrained. And I don't think it's likely to be more constrained by downstream effects. Well, again, I've still got some concerns on the towing and healing of any defenses we just put on top of that existing block wall. Um, also, I've got to put in that on top of there, I mean, this is a question, sorry, it's probably a question staff can answer more. It also brings in a safety concern is that people that are now sitting on the, the green cannot see over into the lake where their um, children are swimming. So we've got as far as on about different types of barriers, but we have different sections put in the uh, uh, portable barrier at one point to allow access during that but also by increasing the slopes down on the, uh, um, into the lake and that, we now form an area where it's like that, where the, the drop off, especially for young children, is increased greatly. I, I know that's not your problem. Uh, it's just something that you might not be, you know, answer. So you're speaking about into the water, correct? Yeah. So, so right now, um, Tyler, can you throw up the one of, the last slides, the Harrison Dyke, like third last slide, maybe fourth or fifth, I had the cross section. I think just to like frame, I should have stopped a bit more, that one, please. So this is in front of the, the Harrison Hotel. And I think 
even though this doesn't show the public beach area, it does show how far out um, sort of into the water um, the current proposed increase would be. And this is kind of consistent along the length of the dike. But so that fill on the water side, which is the left side, is only at 14 meters. So we're not proposing any changes to the lower beach or to, to steepen down there. Um, so that would expect it to be the same as sort of present day conditions. So I think I agree that there would be a, a slope on the top of the dike, um, which you know maybe isn't as good for a flat picnic, but does give people an opportunity to sit down slope with their legs down lookout. Um, but it shouldn't change the, the swimming area. Thank you. Questions from councillors? Yeah, thank you for the uh, presentation report this evening. I think as far as the boat launch is concerned, we do have our aqua dams, which could uh, satisfy that area. If, uh, if, if this project goes through, it's, uh, it's it'll be um, a lengthy project. Of course, a lot of questions have come out tonight are more technical to do with building and everything else. If that's not part of your report, I appreciate that. But um, it's, um, it's something I say that uh, it's been on the radar with the ministry for many years. And, um, and it's with what happened last year, uh, there are many communities now who are going full blast applying for every grant they can get hold of to try and do remediation for, um, God forbid, any major flooding in their communities. So um, this is, firstly, at the level that the businesses are now, the ground level, I'm not talking about those that have balconies, uh, that uh, I, I, I don't see the, the one meter as being a tremendous effect uh, on the uh, vision of the lake. I've seen, you still be able to see um, Echo Island and the lake, uh, you know, even with that one meter there. Um, so, um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's a long way away. Let's get, um, Let's get this report going and the applications moving. Uh, see how, see where we go. I would recommend to um, say it now instead of saying it later. That uh, in the recommendation that uh, the, our MLA and our MP should be uh, should be um, asked to uh, support this as well when the application goes through. That's always um, very helpful um, because it is a federal and provincial grant, I believe. Yeah, it is. Um, and as far as the um, Mount Breckenridge, I know there have been um, there have been a, a, a tests and surveys done by the provincial government there over the last few years, um, and um, hopefully they'll continue to um, to do their surveying and keep a check on that. But of course, it, we have no control over Mother Nature, unfortunately. But uh, again, thank you very much for your presentation; much appreciated, and uh, good luck moving forward with the remainder. Thank you. Thank you very much. On the next order of business, please. Thank you, Your Worship. We'll move on right through eight and nine as we do not have any uh, correspondence on the agenda. We'll move on to number 10, reports of councillors, committees, committee of the whole and commissions. Councillor Hooper. Yeah, good evening again. On the 25th of May, I attended a Zoom meeting and webinar with the Alzheimer's Society of BC on the understanding and care and confidences of uh, um, dementia. On the 25th, I also attended a webinar with the Termac Institute on people planning and progress building collaborative leadership. On the 31st of May, I attended a webinar again with the Terramac Institute, developing a shared SDG action plan through collective impact. 1st of June, I attended a webinar again with the Terramac Institute on changing the digital future. 1st of June, I also attended a Zoom meeting and webinar working with the Alzheimer's Society on living safely with dementia. And on the 3rd of June, outside my uh, portfolio, I attended with members of the BC Cycling Coalition on the crash course for bicycle insurance, which was very useful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Palmer. Um, with regard to my list of responsibilities, uh, I did have a uh, Fraser Valley Regional Library Board meeting on May 18th. I attended that and we have a full day retreat 
later on this month for the library. And uh, also I have organized uh, with Rhonda's help a public art committee meeting for June 16th at three o'clock, which will be our inaugural meeting. And I'm quite excited about it coming together. Uh, so I'll report on that at the next council. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Piper. Thank you, Worship. On May 19th, I attended a Canada Day planning meeting. May 28th, I attended the Tourism Harrison River Valley Open House at the Kilby Historic Site. June 1st, I attended a Mountain Institution Citizen Advisory Committee meeting. Um, a note, they have made it through the COVID outbreak at the institution and now we're permitting in-person meetings. So that's great news all around. Um, for the Harrison Exe Chamber of Commerce meetings, I have a number of um, meetings that I attended, so they'll be a little bit out of date order. My apologies to the scribe. On, uh, I attended the Board of Directors meeting on May 17th. Some of the highlights from that meeting um, is there are plans underway to release grants for community events. Uh, they've struck a marketing committee and uh, a call out for anyone in the community with a passion for marketing, public relations, or graphic design talent, and you'd like to support your community, please get in touch with the chamber at harrison.ca. Um, also continuing with the chamber, on May 24th, I attended a marketing committee meeting. May 19th and 24th, uh, I attended chamber workshops. And uh, my advice is, as these come up, please consider attending them, as both workshops were absolutely excellent. There was um, usually a discount code if you're a chamber member, and uh, future events will be posted on the chamber's website. And on June 3rd, I had the privilege of attending the Agassiz Elementary Secondary School graduation ceremonies and presented two bursaries on behalf of the chamber. And two of Harrison's grads were the recipients. Mr. Carter Briscoe received the chamber bursary in the amount of $500 as he heads off to UVic to pursue a Bachelor of Commerce. And Ms. Patricia Duong received the Ian Ma Memorial Bursary of $500 as she goes off to SFU to study business administration this September. So again, I extend um, my congratulations to both of those fine individuals. And to close off on my report, I'd like to have um, a topic added to our upcoming Committee of the Whole meeting, um, which I believe is in July. Uh, at the chamber meeting back on May 17th, we had a really good conversation um, followed by some subsequent chats about uh, home-based businesses that are based uh, in the community but in, unable to obtain a business license because of the zoning where they live. And of course, we talked about the restrictions. It's uh, zone three and zone fives. Zone three typically has um, less parking just because of the design of those types of lots. But um, discussions, and in my opinion, I think as a result of the pandemic, there's been a real shift in um, people's priorities, uh, their choices of um, work. And um, it's there may be opportunity to provide business licenses if we could have a discussion about that. For those businesses that are more um, uh, web-based or they don't have that face-to-face -face client interaction. So I'm wondering if we could um, add that to the agenda for the cow and have a good discussion about that. That's fine, Council. We just direct uh, staff to add that to the agenda for the, um, I believe it's the 19th of July. That's great. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And that's the end of my report. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Vital. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, one item to report March 26th, I attended the Agassiz Harrison um, Healthy Communities meeting and a um, couple of uh, pertinent uh, highlights that I'd like to share tonight. Um, uh, COVID cases certainly are going down in the uh, Fraser Health um, 
region. And um, fourth boosters, doses are now available at uh, both of our pharmacies um, in Agassi. So you will be notified when your time is due uh, for your vaccination. And then you will be encouraged to book an appointment at uh, one of the two pharmacies. Um, good news that funding has been secured to install air conditioning units, both at Logan Manor and GM Village. Um, this week is Seniors Week, June 6th to 10th. And there are many activities scheduled at the Rec Center. So please look up their activities online or give them a call. Um, very interesting. I don't know that I had mentioned this before, but um, there is a new health program that's going to be um, initiate, initiated called um, the Virtual Care Network. And this program is to provide virtual medical appointments to persons and individuals who are either perhaps um, shut-ins uh, or live in remote areas without access to healthcare services. So um, this has been in the works now for probably about eight months or to a year and the workshop is being scheduled for June 15th. Um, at the Rec Center, which will focus on patient education and awareness on the program. Um, and during the committee, there was also committee meeting, there was also some discussion that perhaps a future workshop uh, to be held here um, in Harrison. Um, there's an open house and plant sale is scheduled at the Earthwise Society on June 11th, and they are eager, eagerly planning some uh, children's summer programs. Also grant application has been submitted to provide the committee the opportunity for a strategic planning session, and a letter of support from the village has been included in the grant application and uh, uh, a huge thank you on behalf of the committee to the village for submitting that letter of support. So I'll we'll keep you updated on the result of that grant application. Um, and that's my report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Next order of business, please. Thank you, Your Worship. We'll move on to number 11, reports from the mayor. I also had the pleasure of attending the uh, Agassi Elementary Secondary School 22 graduation. Um, said a few words on behalf of the community. Um, there's a class was about 40, I would say, and uh, roughly $50,000 was handed out in bursaries, which is a great, uh, great reflection of what comes out of our two communities for um, these graduates. Um, it was nice to have it live again after two years of, uh, of uh, Zooming, but, um, and also then they had the, the procession through Seabird Island, Agassiz, and then through Harrison and onto the resort hotel. Great bunch of people and good luck to all of them. Um, just for a bit of history today, for those who probably most of you know of sitting here tonight, but if you didn't, it's 78 years today that our our troops landed on Juno Beach and D-Day landings. Many lost their lives, many were injured, and it's, um, it's a reflection that we shouldn't forget what these um, men and women did for our country during that terrible time. God bless all of them. Um, when you receive your, um, your um, taxes, there is a newsletter in there which um, outlines the homeowners grant information, how to apply for it, uh, property tax deferment program, the alertable community notifications we have now in the village, get into it Harrison, um, recycling rollout update of the new bins, 
where we have to separate and the information on the um on the extreme heat information as well so that's in with your uh, tax notices now the division of family practice that uh, attended a zoom meeting the um Chilliwack general hospital fourth floor will be reopening in september as they said uh, COVID clinics in the spring campaign are over now, but there is apparently dropping clinics at the Cottonwood Mall on Thursday afternoons. Um, but like Councillor Vidal says, you can go to your local pharmacies now to get your shots. Uh, obviously, the discussion of shortage of doctors was a big topic, and they're trying to do their best they can to try and overcome this um, the shortage in in most places in in the province, um, there was, and also there was the discussion on mental health and the homeless. And as uh, Chilliwack is moving ahead with several um, new new or renovated buildings to try and address some of these problems as well. And at the meeting with the collaborative um, family practice, I did ask that the, um, the committee or committee members should come to one of our council meetings as a delegation to bring us up to date with the new primary care building that's open now on Evans in Chilliwack and bring us up to date on um, how that building is operating and what services are offered there. So they're going to be arranging for um, a day to come as a delegation on that. There's a few other things I just want to clarify. It's more for clarification uh, that um, there was um, information that uh, this uh, Harrison, unfortunately, regatta that's been cancelled this year uh, was due because of the of um, the council cancelling an extra day for them. Well, the regatta has always had a one-day event, and I've got the the official email here from the regatta people that due to low team enrollment, we are cancelling the Harrison Dragon Boat Festival which was to take place on July the 23rd, and they're looking forward to um, come back next year. They say it has been a very challenging year for the sport and their club, and uh, they're going to find ways to, um, to move forward. So that's, a, that's good, hopefully, for, for next year. Regards to our emergency planning in the village, we do have an emergency planning coordinator that um, works for the district of Kent and for the village. And there's also a committee that meets, um, I believe it's every three months uh, as a working committee. Um, the Myself or councillors are not the emergency planners of the village. I say this is done by the, the coordinator who does an outstanding job. And at this time of year, we're getting updates every, every few days regarding the, the freshet. Um, and in regards to any concerns in regards to um, the, um, the um, subdivisions that are being built and the closeness of them, well, they're all being built with their setbacks as per the zoning. And, um, you know, there are other areas of concern in the village that uh, I'm sure that the operators are taken are very cautious uh, on how people are handling their when they're staying there in the campgrounds and that with the amount of um, combustible materials there is in them places. So um, and it, and regarding the public hearings, um, our procedure bylaw allows for a total of fifteen minutes if you wish to speak three times. Uh, you have five minutes for each time and, you, and you, you're welcome to speak three times. So it's a total of 15 minutes and not five minutes. I don't, don't want the public out there to get the wrong impression. And um, I, 
the district of Kent operates the same way in that regards as well. So um, that's how we operate, and it's uh, you have you have many opportunities to speak uh, on the subject matter. Um, we had some complaints about our village uh, office not receiving calls. Well, I can't see how that happened uh, unless it was a day when um, when the um, power was out. But um, our our reception is open from eight thirty to noon and it closes from uh, uh, noon till one o'clock till four thirty, and they're there to um, to answer all your calls and um, myself. Um, or, or anybody else are not in the habit of blocking anybody's calls. Anybody wishes to call the office, the line is there, please call. If you have a problem getting through, just keep trying. Sometimes when all the lines are busy, you may just have to wait uh, till, that, till the line, some lines are clear. Um, now the, the parks and trails, some of you may recall back in 2008, there was a, a report made by Craven Houston Powers that was Village of Harrison Hot Springs Parks and Trails, which identifies all the trails, all the parks, all the areas, and all the um, recommendations in regards to for the future. Also in 2011, Harrison did a sustainable, it, integrated community sustainable plan again which identifies all the areas from transportation to infrastructure to parks trails um, uh, which was also a document that was attended by a committee of 11 i think at the time or 12 that was put together and it was put on by the center for sustainability in whistler and there was a grant that was paid for their time taken to um, to carry out that that process. Um, we've done over the last four years many improvements to all our trails with fresh gravel, and uh, uh, the 200 block was completely done when we got the grant for the trail on the Coombs. That was added to that, so that was completely done. And all trails uh, that basically there's probably two direct trails to the school, but when the, the um, Ortendorf Bridge, uh, before it was built, it was relocated from Miami to Maple Street to Walnut and, um, and Naismith. And the reason being that that would give the children and families or even the um, high school students who catch the bus at the school an opportunity not to have to walk around the Coons Miami River Drive and then onto, um, onto Walnut to get to the school. So by relocating there, that was a perfect straight crossing for all the um, students and parents to go to the school in safety. So um, I just wanted to address those, um, those points because unfortunately some, some comments get out there in the public realm. And I certainly hope that this evening that um, our... Um, our editor from the newspaper is listening to what I'm saying because it's important that uh, people understand that um, the council and our staff are here to help you as much as we can. We all expect to be treated respectfully like we treat you. Um, and it's, um, it's, a it's a pleasure to help, to help our citizens in the best way we can. Uh, the OCP is still moving along. I hope that you all take... Um, time to uh, follow up with a pop-up um, pop-up uh, they call the pop-up events that are coming forward uh, I believe that's in June 22nd 23rd uh, which will also give us give the um, a plan of more more um, information to uh, get this um, plan together of course when it's all put together uh, the council and the APC will be reviewing this uh, to give their um, their um, their points of view on it, and then of course we have a public hearing before it gets into the um, into the final reading of the official community plan. So that's moving along very well, as far as I know. And the next order of business. Uh, oh, just one other question. 
Uh, no, that's it. Thank you. Next order of business, please. Thank you, Worship. We'll move on to number 12 reports from staff. The first report we have is from the operations manager regarding an application for funding to complete necessary upgrades to the Harrison Lake Dyke and the wastewater treatment plant related infrastructure. Mr. Cook. Thank you, Your Worship. In early 2021, Village Council directed staff to engage Northwest Hydraulics, also known as NHC, <clears throat> to complete a flood risk assessment focusing on the Harrison Lake Dyke and the road and infrastructure associated with the Harrison Hot Springs wastewater treatment plant. As you heard earlier, NHC's recommendations uh, are to raise the Harrison Lake protected dike uh, up to 15 meters and the wastewater treatment road elevation to be raised to 14 meters. The Strate Strategic Priorities Fund is one of the three funding streams delivered through the Canadian or Canada Community Building Fund in British Columbia, formerly known as the Gas Tax Fund. The current CCBF agreement provides a 10-year commitment of federal funding for investments in local government infrastructure. The SPF capital in infrastructure stream provides grant funding specially targeted for the capital costs of local government infrastructure projects that are large in scale, regional impact, uh, in or in innovative in supporting the national objectives of productivity and economic growth, a clean environment and strong cities and communities. The SPF program can contribute up a maximum of 100% of the cost of eligible activities to a maximum of $6 million. The deadline for this application is June 30th. Staff recommends engaging NHC to complete the fund, funding application through the Strategic Priorities, Priorities Fund, Canada Community Building Fund for up to $6 million. Recommendation in front of council this evening is that Northwest Hydraulic Consultants be engaged to apply to the Canada Community Building Fund in British Columbia Strategic Priorities Fund on behalf of the village for a grant of up to $6 million in order to undertake the recommended flood mitigation upgrades to the Harrison Lake Dyke, the wastewater treatment plant access road and the foreshore area around the wastewater treatment plant and that the Harrison Hot Springs Village waterfront hydrological assessment by NHC uh, dated May 30th, 2022, be received for information. Thank you, Mr. Cook. So I'm going to split these into two recommendations. First, the funding application, and the second is the receipt of the uh, by hydrotechnical assessment. So for the, for the, the funding, moved by Councillor Piper, seconded by Councillor Vidal. I call the question. Ah, Councillor Palmer. So, <clears throat> sorry. So I, I understand the motion. And I think it's all fine. The only thing I'm not clear on, and, and this is just some confusion in my mind, we had a grant to pay for the study that we will eventually receive uh, for, uh, uh, we'll accept for, uh, for the record. The actual work now to apply for the grant, is that also covered by that grant or is that another pocket of funding? And I'm just wondering where that pocket of funding is coming from and and what, how much money we're actually expending in that. That in no way reflects on the necessity of the work. I just wanna, when I'm voting to have something done, I wanna know the cost. I'll, I'll let Mr. Cook ex explain, but I think the first funding for the, the study was a separate separate one that we received. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is a very good question, Councillor. Uh, the funding is actually, or sorry, the, uh, the uh, time and effort to uh, make the application is actually covered from the original uh, funding uh, uh, that we were able to achieve. Good, thank you. I, I didn't see an amount in there and there's almost always an amount. That's why I was wondering if that's the case. That's helpful, that's, that's the clarification I okay. needed. Thank you. Councillor Hooper. Yes, a couple of quick questions for you to staff. Um, so the funding is only up to 6 million. Um, I say, I don't think it's going to be enough because we're going to be putting weight on top of them. Concrete blocks are already there. Um, we don't know, we don't know the stability of some of them is already undermined by the off flow of water. If we put anything on there, the rainwater will gather behind, seep down and seep underneath them, causing a failure of them. Um, 
So I'd like to have seen a design before we actually got into this because uh, we've had them blocks fall down before some years ago due to water seepage. Um, the say the costing of the six million will that include the engineer's fee for that because in the past we've paid up to 15 percent for engineering fees on projects which comes to nine hundred thousand. so we're already talking about five 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 million grant um so no unless we carry out some form of st stability uh um, survey on them blocks, whether they're actually going to take the weight of any concrete blocks. These concrete blocks must be weighing just on a ton, ton and a half at least. We, uh, um, and what we're going to do with when the rainwater gathers, are we going to put extra drainage in and that? So I don't think six million is going to be enough. So I, I'd hate to see us get the grant and then I need to do half a project and leave the other half empty. So, uh, um, Although I'm in favour of applying for the grant, it's, uh, I don't know, you know, unless we can actually be sure before we actually start any work or, or get the grant, the stability of these, of where this is going to be put and also how we're going to address the problems with the boat launch, the boat launch car park, Rendell Park. And that because say so we've had we've all seen the damage of the runoff for the water now that's got nowhere else to go bar down and out and if it's undermining what we we're putting a weight on top of already uh, we could find ourselves in a few problems thank you thank you for your comments i think i don't know if mr cook has any comments i think there's a lot of unknowns but i think the limit is six million Thank you, Your Worship. That is correct. It is the maximum of $6 million. So we're going to achieve what we can. Uh, and I'm going to try and answer your questions as you, as you ask them. Uh, the design is uh, obviously left with a consultant, so I can't speak directly to that. Um, uh, factors such as drainage and, and additional weight will have to be taken care of that or, or uh, addressed by the geotechnical engineer during the design stage. Um, and I do believe there was another question in there you asked that I I'm failing to remember what you asked. I didn't, I, I'm actually asking you to repeat any anything that I had missed. Did I answer all your questions? So will we carry out a stability study on them blocks before we put any weight on them? that that would be addressed by the geotechnical engineer at the design stage and this is you you said that you hope to get it all done for the six million um we've got you've got a brick wall to build on the uh, um, plaza area we got to address the access points down to the beach and we put in posts in and sliding blocks in between them uh, there's a and the drainage as well on all this, I mean, because we can't allow all that water to drain under them blocks. It's going to cause us problems in the end. Um, but no, thank you very much. I think the uh, the engineers who spoke spoke this evening have got uh, got their work cut out on several of these issues. I think you did mention some drilling work may have to be done. If I'm if am I correct in that? Thank you. So it's um, there's a still uh, their their portion to be carried out uh, before um, to make sure that um, whatever we do will be carried out in a in a proper way. Thank you. Any other comments, Mr. Cook? Is that it? No. Okay. Thank you. So um, on the question for the the grant, any other comments? I'll call the question then. All in favour? Opposed, nobody opposed. Motion passes on that. And the second of the House North Springs Village Waterfront Hydro Technical Assessment by NHC dated May 30th to be received for information. Moved by Councillor Palmer, second by Councillor Piper. 
Any discussion on that? No, call the question or in favor? Opposed anybody? No, thank you, motion passes. Next order business, please. Thank you, the next report we have is from the Chief Administrative Officer regarding proposed federal electoral boundary adjustment. Ms. McDonald. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to the rest of council and the people in the gallery. This is an issue that most people will be familiar with already because um, most people received a, a mail out from the Federal Electoral Boundaries Commission in the mail, looked like a bit of a newspaper. And the proposal is what they're proposing, the Federal Electoral Boundaries Commission for BC is proposing that um, the, the federal electoral boundary be changed for our area and that Harrison Hot Springs in the District of Kent be taken out of the Chilliwack um, electoral riding and uh, shifted into the Mission Maple Ridge riding. Um, there's, this raises some obvious concerns uh, for our area in that most residents receive their um, uh, services from the greater Chilliwack area rather than the Mission Maple Ridge area. Um, I've certainly met with the senior staff of the District of Kent and there's concerns in that community as well. Um, Maple Ridge and Mission are not the primary service areas for our residents. And in fact, there's not even public transit, a public transit link with those areas from either Harrison or Kent. So the commission is at this stage seeking feedback on the proposed changes and it's recommended that the village both write to the commission and attend the upcoming consultation meeting in Chilliwack. And of course that's open to members of the public as well. That's on September 19th, 2022 at 7 p.m. at the Coast Hotel. The recommendation for council's consideration is that the village write to the Federal Electoral Boundaries Commission for BC, objecting to the Federal Electoral Boundary Adjustment proposed for the ridings of Chilliwack and Mission Maple Ridge. Thank you, and there's a motion moved by Councillor Piper, second by Councillor Vital discussion, Councillor Palmer. Um, <clears throat> I'm um, confused. So I just wanted to, so Brad Viss is our MP. Brad Viss is the MP for Mission Matsqui. So we already are part, we're not part of the Chilliwack federal riding. We haven't been, so we're not being taken from it. Mark Strahl is the MP for Chilliwack, which is south of the river. So I'm confused about this. We're, we're already in, uh, we're already in the riding that uh, with, with Mission and, and, and Matsqui and mm. Kent. Um, what I understood from talking to Brad okay. um, last weekend was that the new proposal would pop us with some communities further towards the Okanagan as well, and that that takes us out of being the Fraser, uh, uh, the uh, Fraser Regional District. And that was a concern that he wanted me to understand that he wanted you know us to consider. But I I don't think the issue is Chilliwack. Chilliwack's a, is we're not in the Chilliwack riding, right? We're we're uh, we're in a riding with with Matt's Queen Mission, which seems like maybe an odd, uh, an odd match. So um, I think that was a concern. So writing the letter I'm supportive of because I, I don't know that I'm happy with what I've seen they want to change it to, but I, I don't get from the, I, don't, I think the report is just, isn't, isn't accurate to what, the, to what the issue is. But I think the issue is that we want to stay in a riding that is basically based in the Fraser Valley Regional District and not be included in an area where there's no similar concerns to us. That's what I understand from my reading of the report and, and my discussion with, with Brad. Thank Does you. the CAO have any comments on that? Uh, yes, I do. And I want to thank Councillor Palmer for offering that clarification. I think the recommendation to Council can stand as it is, but I apologize for um, any misrepresentation in my report. Uh, Councillor Piper. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you to staff for a uh, report. Um, I just want to uh, kind of rally the troops and <laughs> encourage everybody to attend on September 19th. Um, I'm worried that um, it may change the, uh, the region that we belong to. So it would be nice to have that clarified. And I do um, Hope that our fine citizens show up in great numbers uh, September 19th at the Coast Hotel. Thank you. Any, uh, Co Councillor Vidal, Councillor Hooper. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just through you to our um, CEO. Uh, at, at this point in time, also individual residents can also voice 
um, of their concern and is the process for that just to phone them or to access the website do you have anything any clarification on that thank you there is a website and people can fill out a survey in advance of the uh, uh, live public consultation sessions also the public consultation sessions in um September are open to the public, so we can post something on our Facebook site or on our news section of our website, so people have access to the correct information, certainly. And yes, this is a public process. People are invited to give their feedback. Thank you. So, Councillor Hooper. Yes looked into this a bit and since 1977 there's been eight boundary changes within the Fraser Valley and they've not really affected anybody. As far as I can make out with this boundary change is because Chilliwack has grown substantially and they're trying to equal out the amount of voters in each of the sections. Um, I haven't got a problem with the boundary changes so I'm afraid you know I can't support recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. I believe there's been one extra one, Sarah added. Is it 49 now? Yes. Uh, the reason for the, the changes, um, and it's correct that they're changed fairly frequently, is because after every federal census, um, there's constitutional requirements to um, make sure that there's the right number of ridings in every province or territory. So there's been one added to British Columbia as a result of the recent uh, census and so then um, it's a matter of of sort of massaging the boundaries to make sure that uh, they, they balance out the various ridings and that's why the proposed changes are in front of you for the discussion no i call the question oh council palmer oh cool. okay <laughs> all, all, all in favor of the recommendation opposed Opposed by Councillor Hooper, motion passes. Thank you. For the business, please. Thank you, Your, Your Worship. We'll move on to the next report, also from the Chief Administrative Officer regarding the 2021 annual report. And before um, we proceed, uh, do you want to take this time to ask the public if they have any uh, input into the annual report? If there's any members of the public this evening who wish to ask a question regarding the annual report, please come up to the microphone. Or before, uh, before, sorry, just give me a second, Mr. Allen. Maybe we should check with our Zoom participants first, please. Thank you. Uh, anyone on Zoom with a question about the annual report? Uh, just use the raise your hand feature. Uh, looks like we don't have any questions. Nobody? Okay. Good evening. Uh, let me just say thank you for providing me with a copy of the annual report. I got it here tonight when I came to the meeting. I've been asking for it at the village office and they wouldn't give me one there. So I wasn't able to study a hard copy in past years, we went to the village office up to two weeks ahead of this meeting. We were given a hard copy to take home and study, and we didn't get it this time. Just so one second, sir. I'm saying thank you for yeah, your no, eventually, just, yeah, belatedly just, giving just, just me give this me a report. Second. I'll let corporate office has a comment on that. I just wanted to advise council that the annual report has been uh, available for public inspection for two weeks at the at the reception desk. Yes, the. The corporate officer is correct. It was available if you're prepared to stand there and read it. There isn't even a chair anymore to sit in, but we didn't. We weren't able to take a copy home and read it in the comfort of our own homes, which is what we have traditionally been given in the past, but we weren't given this time. Uh, we won't get into that, Miss Allen. Please carry on with your question. Thank you. Well, I'm just saying thank you for, you know, eventually delivering the report. Um, it's a bit confusing because the, the report includes quite a bit about this raising of the dike. And my question, my first question would be, 
why did we use a, uh, a wind record from Agassiz to try and understand the winds at Harrison? Because they're totally different. It's like the interface. Excuse me, sir, we're talking about the annual report. I know. But well, we're, not, we're not into the hydraulics of what the presentation just happened. The proposed raising of the dike is in the annual report, Mr. Mayor, yeah, but project just, but, but for but 2022. Please, please. Sorry? Ask about the financial part of it, not why the wind uh, is in uh, um, um, instruments are in Agassiz and not Harrison. So I'm not allowed to ask any questions unless they're strictly of a financial oh, nature? Uh, this is what, that's what the financial report is for. This is not a financial report, Mr. Mayor. This is the annual report, sir. If you have any specific questions regarding to the annual report, please please specify it so our, our um, financial officer can try and answer you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, this is not a financial report. This is the annual report, I, which is a different animal completely. Mr. Mayor, we already had the financial report for 2021 delivered. Questions regarding the statements on there, please ask for it, ask, ask it now. Thank you. But Mr. Mayor, Excuse my, me. Excuse my me, your questions worship. should not be limited to financial matters. They should be open to any issue that is laid out in the financial report, financial or otherwise. We have had the financial report. You approved that a couple of months ago. Okay. We are this is not a financial report. Well, my question is, how can you have a report about wave run-up without understanding the wind pattern in Harrison, which is quite different from Agassiz? We have years and years of data and records about Harrison winds, uh, particularly through the Wind Sports Society that has two or three weather stations. We know exactly what the wind does here. And one of the things we know about that wind is that it does not blow from the north in summertime when we have high water. It blows from the north in February. That's well established. We do not have high water in February. We have low water in February. And what page are you on, sir? Well, it's the page that talks about the projects for 2022. Okay. And your uh, next question? Dear. Mr. Allen, can you please tell us what page you're on, sir? Sorry? Can you please tell us what page well, you're on? Well, give me a moment. If, if I had been given a copy of this report two weeks ahead or a month ahead, as I should have been done, I would have it well marked and noted. But I only got it tonight, so now I'm going to have to leaf through it and find that section. So give me a moment. Uh, Mr. Allen, there may be other people in the audience that I'm not going to hold up the whole meeting You've, you've been able to go to the office and read this over for two weeks. So please, can we move this on? Thank you. Well, Mr. Mayor, I don't feel at all like you're open to any of my questions. On I'm open report. to all your questions. Just please tell us the page that you're on so we can move on. Well, let me work through these, these notes that I have and I'll get well, back to it. it. We're not going through this whole annual report. You've already, we've already done the financial statements. We've had the open house. So this is just an annual report. So if you have two or three questions, please ask them now. Thank you. There's nothing in the legislation that limits me to two or three questions, Mr. Mayor. Uh, That's your limit. Mr. Allen, are you going to be respectfully conducting this or, uh, or are you not? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to ask a question about uh, page 17. Thank you. On page 17, we have the 2022 goals. And I'd like to make one observation that very little of the goals in this annual report are goals that are stated in our official community plan. And they really should be. The purpose of the OCP is to set out the goals and then they should be fulfilled. But that's not happening in this case. At the bottom of 
the 2022 goals. It says, construct new pedestrian trail along McCombs Drive and complete the Miami River Greenway Trail. Now, um, the pedestrian trail along McCombs Drive, I think, is finished now. You've got benches up and things on the, the gravel path. But the Miami River Greenway Trail uh, is not complete. And I'd like to ask some details as to what it is you propose to do to complete the Miami River Greenway Trail. And I'm thinking particularly of the section that runs on the north side of the river from Macomb Drive back to the Ruth Altendorf Bridge. Is that the section of the trail that you intend to complete this year? It's all, com or, or it's if all complete. Not, what do you, do you intend to do? They're all completed. Objective? They're all completed to the uh, Ortendorf Bridge. On the north side of the river, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, there's all fresh gravel there. Sorry? There's all fresh gravel there's completed. That's on the south side of the river. No, and the north, north side where it goes on to Walnut. Are you referring to Walnut? On the north side of the river? Are you referring, it goes from Miami River Drive to Walnut, the Ortendorf Bridge. Miami River Drive intersects Walnut. Sorry, it yes. goes from Naismith to Walnut. From Naismith to Walnut. Yes, that's the trail. Uh, no, there's no trail on the east or north, the east side of the river or the north side. The northeast side, the other bank of the river, is Miami River Trail yeah. right to McCombs Drive. From Naismith, as you get off the road, there's a gravel trail with a garbage bin on the corner. Then you get to the bridge, you cross the bridge, and there's a gravel trail all the way to Walnut. That's on the west and the south side of the river, not on the north and the there's east There's nothing side. on the north, east of the bridge. It's the river. Yes, but there is a trail there, Mr. Mayor. No. We, own, we own the yeah. land the, on that bank. The and the purpose of the Miami River Greenway Trail was to have that trail on both sides of the river uh, between McCoon Drive and the Ruth Altendorf Bridge. The, so the, is that the section that you're proposing to finish? The here? trail is on the west side going from the Wal 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 Altendorf Bridge to the Fred Hardy Bridge. That's that is, there. That is, that is part of the trail that is finished. That's all, that's all been, and then we, we also finished the 200 block. But you haven't done anything about the trail on the other side of the river. But, Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the scope uh, the, the, in the annual report, it's referring to the Miami River, uh, the 200 block project, or, or 200 block section, and the Miami, or sorry, the McCombs Drive section that was under the capital project. And the reason why it was in here because it was not actually complete until earlier this year. So, is there any more work to be done on the Miami River Greenway Trail this year? With respect to the project that was uh, uh, completed earlier this year, no. Okay. Well, the trail is incomplete until it's built on both sides of the river, Mr. Mayor. At the end of that 2022 goals into recreation, culture, and tourism on page 17, um, there's an objective to add an overhead cover to the starlight skating rink. So I'd like to know is the starlight skating rink going to be erected uh, this coming winter? If so, where is it going to be erected? What is an overhead cover? And what will that cost? And who is paying for it? I believe that report came out of a regular council meeting that you were at, but I'll pass this on to Ms. Shell to uh, just clarify that for you. The plan is, uh, as long as there are no further health restrictions, that the rink will- Sorry, I can't hear. Can you get closer to the microphone, please? If you turn your microphone off, your speaker will work. Okay. Um, the plan, uh, considering there's no public health restrictions, the rink will reopen uh, this fall. The Starlight Skating Rink Overhead Cover is a concept at this time included in the 2022 to 2025 Regional um, Resort Development Strategy, and the RMI fund would be paying for this structure. Thank you. Supplementary question, will this be a 
a structural steel cover or a canvas cover or a tent or what is envisioned for this? As I mentioned at this time, it's a concept. Okay, it's a concept. On page 31 of the report, uh, at the bottom of the page, it says the village has determined that as of December 31st, 2021, no contamination in excess of an environmental standard exists to land not in productive use for which the village is responsible. Can I take that to mean that we have received a clearance from the Ministry of Environment for the old landfill and garbage dump uh, on McPherson Road and that we no longer have any responsibility or liability? Or does this mean that it's still under study and we're not out of the woods yet? Ms. Kay? Thank you, Your Worship, to Mr. Allen. Uh, that uh, process is still un underway. Uh, the consultant will be um, delivering the final report and that final report will be submitted to the province. And is that something that's going to happen during the 2022 year? Your Worship, <laughs> uh, that depends on the time it takes for the uh, province to um, provide a response. Actually, I'm finding this very helpful now that I have a speaker. I understand how you people are able to hear, and we can't back here because you have the speaker option. But on page number six, 16, uh, at the bottom of the 2022 goals, it says upgrade flood pump access. Now, as I understand it, the flood pump access is the road on top of the dike across the front of the Harrison Hotel. Um, what more are you planning to do and why is that existing access inadequate? Mr. Cook? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the access will actually be for, be for staff for maintenance purposes. Sorry, I was slow to get my, my speaker turned on. Could you repeat that, please? The access will be for staff to access the flood pump gates in order to maintain them. It will not, sorry, the intake uh, to the flood pump, and it will only be for staff, not public access. And is this for vehicle access or personnel access? That would be for personnel access. Thank you. On page number 15, um, 2022 gold says complete renovations to the boat launch building. Could I ask what it is you intend to do to the boat launch building? Are you going to raise it, expand it, move it? I haven't seen any plans for that yet. And are there plans already? And if so, how much is it going to cost and who is going to pay for it? Michelle? This is a carry forward project from the uh, 2019 re, um, resort development strategy funded through the RMI program. The concept is to add an addition onto the north side of the building that would work as a concession and skate rental shop in the winter and a boat launch operator office in the summer. Thank you. Isn't there already a boat launch office in the center of the building? There is, but it doesn't have to have uh, sufficient space for a skate rental shop. So it would be dual purpose. Okay. Um, the third goal on page number 15 is to upgrade lift station number one to increase pumping capacity. Uh, what exactly will be done with pump station number one? Will it be replaced, expanded, uh, extra pumps, bigger pumps? What is the plan for pump station number one? Mr. Cook. Thank you, Your Worship. We're still at the design stage, the pre-design stage. Uh, there's a few options in front of us. We could up, up size pumps, we could add a new uh, wet well. There's a few uh, uh, options that the engineer is looking at. We haven't actually made a final decision. 
Thank you. Um, at the bottom of that list of goals, it talks about installing a new emergency backup generator at the water intake facility. Now, as I understand, that is the generator that's behind the chain link fence on the west side of the beach washrooms. Um, all of that is going to be well below the 15 meter flood level that we heard about earlier tonight. So if you're going to put in an emergency backup generator to keep the village's water supply coming out of the lake, won't you need to put that up at at least 15 or 16 meters to ensure that that does not get flooded out if we have such a high water? Mr. Cook? <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. That'd have to be uh, reviewed at the time uh, when we're talking to the supplier. Well, I don't think they make submarine generators, so you have to do something. The last one on that page 15 talks about update the subdivision development servicing bylaw to meet current industry standards and best practices. Um, as I recall, we already paid CTQ consultant $65,000 to write us such a bylaw about two or three years ago. Where is that and why is that not being brought forward and dealt with by council? Because if it's not, it seems like an awful waste of money. My concern is that we're now approving subdivisions such as the new one on Hot Springs Road under an old bylaw, which according to this, uh, does not meet current industry standards and best practices. So why are we approving subdivisions under a bylaw that we recognize as being inadequate? <laughs> um, yes, Your Worship, through you, I can uh, offer a, a little bit of uh, an update on that. This is the subdivision and development uh, servicing bylaw that CTQ developed for us. It got back burnered for a number of reasons. We had a change in personnel and then, of course, um, COVID hit and uh, a lot of our projects were delayed during that time. So uh, now uh, our operations manager is uh, completing his review of the subdivision and servicing development servicing bylaw, and it will be coming back to council um, as soon as possible. In the meantime, uh, it's just been a more lengthy process to uh, review and approve subdivisions and developments because we don't have uh, all of the detail in a modern bylaw, but I can assure council that uh, all of the work and recommendations that have come before them have been in accordance with modern standards and legislation. Thank you. On page um, 42, item uh, D, the village has entered into various agreements and contracts for provision of services. Um, I've recently had occasion to try and understand why Harrison Hot Springs doesn't no longer has its own building bylaw and somehow the regional district bylaw applies within our jurisdiction. And I still can't figure out the sovereignty issues surrounding that. One thing I did discover is that the village is supposed to pay 6% of our gross tax income to the regional district. Uh, in exchange for providing this service. And, and that seems to be a bit strange because I, as I understand it, they also get to keep all of the application and inspection fees with every building permit. So I'd like to ask uh, how much did the village of Harrison pay to the Fraser Valley Regional District last year as part of that agreement to pay 6%. And do we know how much they received in application and inspection fees from the people trying to build in Harrison Hot Springs? That's um, a financial question, Mr. Mayor. Yes. You asked for that. Your Worship, uh, thank you for uh, handing that question off to me. Um, certainly the decision to enter into the service provision area 
for building inspection with the regional district was made quite some time ago under a previous council and it's not addressed in this annual report. So it's not really a subject matter for tonight's discussion. But with respect to the financial arrangement between the Village of Harrison Hot Springs and the FVRD, uh, we would pay for the service through our requisition because we are in their service area. This is not under an agreement. We are, we are now within the previous council made a decision to enter into the building inspection service area that's separate from uh, the arrangement that was previous to that, which was under a contractual agreement. So there is no payment for building inspection services. It comes as part of our requisition. And if anybody in the audience had more specific questions about that portion of the requisition, they'd be um, welcome to bring those questions to the village office or by email. And we would forward those to our finance department to drill down into those um, details. With respect to the permitting fees and um, those sorts of revenues, these municipal services are meant to be um, provided on a cost recovery basis. So that's what the regional district attempts to do as a local government is structure their fees for these services, permit fees and inspection fees on a cost recovery basis to pay for this essential service. Well, that almost answers the question, Mr. Mayor, and I understand clearly that Fraser Valley Regional District gets to keep all of the application and inspection fees, but the bylaw that I was given by the village states that the village will pay in addition to that 6% of our gross revenue to the regional district for providing building inspection services. If that bylaw has been amended, uh, I'd like to ask for a copy of the amending bylaw if that 6% has been dropped because the way the current legislation stands, uh, we are supposed to pay them 6% on top of our normal requisition that we collect on their behalf through our tax notices, which I received today. Thank you very much, my 2022 tax notice. Oh. Um, yes, I, I would um, encourage Mr. Allen to bring that question forward in the form of an email or a letter to village staff. Uh, we need some clarification on what bylaw you're referring to, et cetera, but it's uh, outside of the scope of what we can answer this evening. Okay. Um, the other thing that, that's mentioned in the annual report, which I think should be a, a high priority, is the interface fire risk. And uh, we're, we've been getting recent reports out of Lytton that talk about the fact that the fires, when the houses are close together, the fires simply migrate from one to the other and cause a conflagration. And we are at high risk of that. And the, the annual report does not contain anything that I see that talks about what the village intends to do to mitigate the interface fire risk to reduce fuel in our own parkland and wooded areas. And we own 73 acres alongside Macomb Drive that's full of fuel that we're not, we're not looking after responsibly as landowners because we haven't cleared that out. So uh, the annual report doesn't seem to, to highlight the need to do some real uh, cleanup of the fuel, make some real plans to fight a forest fire and to deal with this emerging risk. In addition to which, the fire report that you have received has got the wind patterns completely backwards from what they actually are because they used a wind station at Hope. So, so people are misled by that report, which doesn't, which doesn't accurately portray the reality of the afternoon winds blowing hard. Am I cut off? It doesn't. Can we get back, Mr. Allen? There's a lot of time being spent here on you giving your usual grandstanding on most things. Mr. And I, Mayor, say that, I say that with respect. Right. But we do have our fire departments. We have got the plan. You may have heard me say earlier this evening if there are areas which I did say that I assume that the owners of campgrounds 
are very responsible because there's more combustible materials in campgrounds than there is in houses. Not in mine, sir. Uh, I, I, I didn't, if, please let me finish speaking. I said respectfully that campground owners are responsible, but there are areas like that that do have a lot of combustible material. Everybody in a campground has a, has a propane tank. You know, so houses being built close together are built with materials that not like they used to go up so quickly in the, in the old days. I mean, setbacks are there in the zoning, whether it's the, 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 the subdivision on the west side or the 10 houses facing them on the east side, the widths between the homes, whether they're bigger homes, smaller homes, they're still the same. So our fire department, after at, when a development goes through, and you know this, the fire department is consulted about the specific subdivision, how it relates to access and how it relates to them uh, fighting the fires. And that's addressed at the, uh, at the development stage. So we, we do have, we're very conscious of the fire, the, the boulevard on McCombs has been cut back tremendously to what it used to be. It virtually used to be right up to the road, but it's cut right back. It had nothing to do even before the pathway went in there. The regional district do their own assessment of, of the fuel in the, in the area that they look after. Every, they go in, they take an assessment. Of course, it's an area where you cannot go in with a logging truck. There's no way to get in there with any type of truck. So fuel, as you know, that lays on the ground becomes, it breaks down and it becomes like soil eventually. It's good for the earth. Yes, obviously there are areas where there's a buildup of, of, uh, of, um, of fuel, but that is something that is inspected and it's looked after as best we can. We have our fire departments, we've had open houses. Most people pick up the booklet about protecting their homes, clearing their eaves troughs, taking away any combustible stuff that's around their homes, any trees that may have to be removed because of fire. So all these things, People are aware, or it's all on our website. Now, your next question, sir, because I want to get on with this. Council as yet has to ask a question as well about the annual reports. So what is your next question, please? Well, Mr. Mayor, uh, I would just like to ask Council to seriously consider reviewing the separations between buildings in our zoning bylaw in light of the experience at Lytton. And take the advice of the people that are dealing with that reality and perhaps ask if we haven't allowed the separations to shrink to the point where they're dangerous. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the public this evening on the annual report. The CAO will present the report. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just a quick word to say that Section 98 of the Community Charter requires that this report be prepared by June 30th of each year and made available to the public for at least two weeks prior to the meeting, which it was. Uh, it was made available for public inspection on May 17th, 2022, and of course it was on our website that entire time. Uh, it, uh, Section 99 of the Community Charter requires that Council must consider the report at a meeting held at least 14 days after the report was made available for public inspection, and this date meets that criteria, so the recommendation is that the 2021 annual report be approved. Looking for a mover and seconder. Moved by Councillor Piper, seconded by Councillor Vidal. Discussion? Councillor Piper, Councillor Hooper. Thank you, Worship. Just a really quick uh, comment. Uh, thank you for another informative uh, annual report. A year goes by so quickly, and so this is a valuable uh, review tool. And I want to extend my uh, gratitude and thanks for including um, 
MRDT and uh, RMI explanations and the amounts. This is going to, um, well, it should assist greatly with perception and uh, knowledge within the community. So I, I deeply appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Just uh, an observation. It says here under on page 49 that we have uh, 1,905 full-time residents and a total private dwellings of 1045. So if you work that out on the uh, Statistics Canada, there's 2.5 persons per household, 261 households within the village remain empty at one point of the year. Uh, um, which isn't the problem, but the 1905 uh, full-time resident is a great increase from the previous one. Now, once we reach 2,500, we lose our status as a village, we become a town. And I anticipate that will happen within the next eight years. And that's part of the uh, um, Local Government Act. Thank you. question that one thank you um any other comments from council i like the um i like the statistical section that um <clears throat> council piper brought up in regards to the um tourism um i like the the tax rates that was shown, I can remember when we were in the hundreds many moons ago, and now we're at 36 and what's 39 for business. The village, and this is, the, this is a good guide for those folks who for some reason are still not quite familiar with the difference between the RMI and the MRDT as two separate identities. They deal in two different, the MRDT of course is, uh, is what Tourism Harrison does and it's the, uh, it's the marketing um, projects programs. And of course the RMI is the infrastructure that, that has beautified this whole village. Without that uh, RMI, we wouldn't be the beautiful village that we are today because um, that money that's coming in through the hotel tax. Um, the, um, I'd like to thank the staff for putting all this together and that um, I keep getting younger every year. I like that one, that um, mayor's message, but um, a good report and um, everything that, um, if people have taken the time even to look it up on their website, lays it out very nicely here. The, uh, the organization chart operates, the council and the, plan, the planning, the finance departments and the, the corporate sides of it. It's a very well laid out plan. Thank you very much. And if there, is there any other questions from council before I call the question? Being none, I call the question all in favor. Opposed anybody? Nobody opposed. Motion passes. An next order of business, please. Thank you, Your Worship. We'll move on through 13 on to number 14. Do you have any new business? Thank you. We'll move on to questions from the public pertaining to agenda items only. Tyler, do we have anyone attending via Zoom to ask a question? Yes, uh, any of our Zoom participants, if you have a question, please use the raise your hand feature. Uh, looks like we don't have any questions. Any questions from the public this evening? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Mayor, John Allen, 398 Hot Springs Road. I listened with great interest to the uh, Northwest Hydraulics Report. What I didn't hear was any mention of what actually happened in 1948. And in 1948, we did not get flooded from Harrison Lake or Harrison River. We got flooded from Agassiz and the water came down the valley, past the golf course, into the Miami River and had to get into the lake. 
Today, if that dike in Agassiz fails and the water comes from Agassiz, the first thing we will need to do is to start digging holes in the dike to let the water get into the lake. So that was, that was the, the same direction of flood water flow that has happened for the last 10,000 years. And if we are going to get a flood, it's probably going to be that flood, not a flood from the lake, because the lake is static water with no north wind in the summertime. Our biggest threat is actually overland flows from Agassiz, and that isn't addressed in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. It's, um, I, I just briefly will mention the history book. That's all I go by, and it's written by a well-known former resident is not with us anymore, but um, I believe that the, the lake and the Fraser River met at the golf course. That's where the, the two met uh, at that time. Um, and the, the one time that it was, now I'm going back, oh, I don't know, a few years back, we had a very, very extreme heavy rainfall at Lillooette, and Agassiz was fine, but the river, uh, sorry, the lake, it was at a point where well, I was nearly going to call an evacuation. It got so high. At that time, we only had the, the old pump. We didn't have the new pump. Uh, and it, all that water came down from Lillooet. So that, that had nothing to do with the, uh, with the Fraser or the Harrison River. That was one incident at that time. But uh, any questions, sir, at the back there? We'd like to ask a question this evening. Okay, before I close the meeting. For a point of clarification, <laughs> Lillooet is on the Fraser River. It does not flow into Harrison Lake. The Lillooet. Lillooet is at the far end of the lake. No, Lillooet is on the Fraser River. Uh, it's the far end of the lake. It came from there. Oh, well, then it came from the Lillooet River. And That's what I Hendon. said. That's what I Not said. Lillard. Oh, no, you just said. Thank Lillard. you. Maybe Thank I'm you. sorry. Maybe my interpretation wasn't exactly correct. Sir. I shall now call any other body else. No, I'll call a question to a German Palmer, <laughs> Councillor Piper. All in favor. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks, for coming out this evening. Thank you for our team, for your presentation. Thank you, staff.